I would like to welcome next Essie Wagner uh, with NHTSA, a wonderful person. I hope you all get a chance to meet with her today. She has a lot of experience and um, just a good friend. Um, really, uh, my, my topic today, what I was asked to talk about, is the national perspectives on, on safety and, and how it works. And I was like, well, how about we just talk about what I do more often? Um, and that's really try to translate research into something useful. Um, before I go on, though, I do want to note Iowa's leadership uh, on all of these traffic safety issues. Uh, people like Kim, people like Tom, have been out there doing work internationally and, and really making Iowa look great uh, in the rest of the world, you know, creating the flexible license renewal policies. That's a national model. Other states are saying, wow, you can do that? You can go out and, and give people licenses just for their local areas? Okay, we'll do that. You know, adopting the roadway design guidelines. Those are things that even, you know, Australia says, wow, Iowa's doing that? Okay, we can do it too. Um, you're really, you're fostering an environment where you have creative people doing creative things to help the rest of the community and you're not you're exporting the ideas but you're not exporting the people and so I think that's really to be commended so thank you for that um, before I go on into talking about older driver stuff I need to introduce NHTSA which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration I don't know if you're familiar with us uh, we're the people who uh, our mission is to save lives and prevent injuries on, from crashes in our, on our nation's roads. It's a, a pretty straightforward kind of thing. It's very easy to, to understand it and to get behind it. I mean, how can you be against saving lives? You can't. Um, and we get a progress report every day when we open up the newspaper and go, oh, no, not this one. And we go out every day and we're trying to do better. We're trying to save those lives. We're also re responsible for vehicle safety standards, uh, things like you know getting the airbags into cars uh, all those years ago. Uh, we're responsible for CAFE standards, the corporate average fuel economy. We did the, the CARS program, uh, you know, cash for clunkers, as everybody knows it as. And we also manage the, the FARS database, which is the fatality analysis reporting system, and uh, a lot of the other crash databases. So. Things that you probably use in your daily work uh, are things that we have a hand in. So with regard to older drivers, we've had a program in place for 20 years now, uh, mostly with research. A lot of that research was done here in Iowa um, at the, the old Iowa driving simulator, and what it, uh, eventually grew up to be NADS, um, as well as other researchers along and around in the state here. The reason that we got behind doing this kind of research is because we were sort of looking into the crystal ball of the future, saying, oh gosh, those baby boomers, in 20 years, they're going to be older drivers. We have to do something to address this issue. We have to get them off the road. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Um, and then through doing our research, we realized that's not going to be effective. <laughs> it's going to get a lot of people hating us, and, and, and by the way, it's not necessarily going to be the right thing to do. There are so many people who are, are capable of driving safely, so why don't we try to focus on the people <coughs> who are at risk? And so that was sort of where the research led us in the way. So we had these population pressures. Uh, we also have, in addition to the, the baby boomers changing, we, all, we saw that older people were living longer and they're living healthier lives, so they're going to be out there on the roads. So we had that. We also saw there were some pressures, uh, as we call it, um, from uh, exposure. They're out there driving more, particularly the baby boomers. The women are going to be driving so much more than the earlier cohorts, like the older drivers, where the women were sitting in the passenger seat and the men were in the driver's seat. Baby boomers, uh-uh. <laughs> We're not doing that. We're going to be driving ourselves. So we had to make sure that we were addressing those kinds of issues. 
And then the, the last pressure that we have to address is, is that frailty pressure. There's nothing really that we can do to change the individual's ability to recover or withstand the crash forces. So we have to make the, the vehicle itself safer and we have to make sure that that crash doesn't happen in the first place. So those are the kinds of things that we, uh, that shaped us and are shaped our thinking when we decided to uh, set our program, our program goal as to hold the line on fatalities. We knew that there were going to be things that were going to be pushing those numbers up, but we decided that we had to make sure that they stayed at least level and hopefully would go down. We'll see in, uh, I guess it's 13 months, whether or not all our hard work uh, has really been effective <laughs> when, when the baby boomers do start turning 65, but we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Now in 2001, I said part of what I do is, is translate uh, research. We did all this research, research, research. And I translate that into something useful. And it's really harder than you would think. And it's like, well, okay, you know, it's like I can take that report and take it off the shelf and say, okay, everybody do this. And, and then having people hear me is really not easy. Um, what we decided to do is look to um, other people that have a, a common mission with us. So for the older driver program, we looked at uh, to partners such as the American Medical Association, uh, where we developed the Physician's Guide for, asso for, for Assessing and Counseling Older Drivers. Uh, what we saw is we want to um, help physicians <coughs> counsel their, their patients, and physicians were already identified as being important, um, legitimate, and listened to sources for good traffic safety information, but they had no idea what to say. And so what we did together is we came up with this guide. We're about to come out later on, it'll be early next year, for a revised version of the Physician's Guide, if you're familiar with that. Um, we've also established partnerships with the American Association on Aging and the American uh, Occupational Therapy Association, um, different people who have common mission to save lives and to educate their, their users on how to help people save lives and to ha continue staying out there and being active and involved in the community, but uh, doing it safely. So the important thing to remember is that we always, always, always have a foundation in research. Research tells us where to go. Uh, we can't, you know, we're like, oh yeah, let's go ahead and, and do a program on X. And no, we can't do that. We have to, to have some evidence basis for what we're doing. There's a lot of what Dan was talking about there. Um, one of the, the programs, one of the projects, and this is what uh, Kim alluded to that we worked together on for forever, was uh, this right here, the Driver Fitness Medical Guidelines, which just came out. It says September, but it was October 2nd. I know because I was jumping up and down when this came out. We started working with AMVA, which is the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. Um, we've been working with them for years anyhow, um, because licensing has something to do with traffic safety, we think. We've always thought that. Um, also, at the same time, our research was suggesting that our it's not necessarily age, that it's abilities, it's functional ability that makes a person safe or unsafe. I mean, you know, we have, we, we know there are people at age 50 that have early stage dementia. We also know that there are people who are in their 80s who are running marathons. So we know it's not age, we know it's function. So yeah, six years ago we started this project. And we, and it's sort of like herding cats, um, <laughs> getting, getting the physicians to, to understand licensing, getting licensing to understand uh, what, the, what the doctors were having to say. And we came up with an evidence-based guide for making licensing decisions. It's really a very uh, useful tool. Um, it has information on how you have to, as a, as a DMV administrator, how you have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It sounds really benign, but it's really critically important. 
um, I'm sure you <laughs> understand completely. You don't want to have people uh, arguing with you over what you're doing. You want to actually have to show them, uh, have to have them demonstrate that they are safe as drivers. Seems reasonable in terms of that. And we learned through the process that the, those are the ways that we have to do it. Um, it has information for the driver licensing administrators on making um, outreach and communications with the other people, you know, people with the, you know, MS, people with uh, diabetes, people with dementia. Um, do outreach for, for those individuals. Say, these are the things that we expect of you. Um, also for their for the physicians, so, so if you make a referral to us, this is what we're going to need to have from you. The other thing that it includes um, is sort of the dissenting opinions. Um, you, you know, we, you, you try to come to consensus on these things, um, but sometimes people just aren't going to come to an agreement on why you think you should be doing something, and in particular, uh, this uh, has some, uh, 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 an appendix in here um, describing the dissent from the American Diabetes Association, saying they think it should be this way, then uh, the DMV people say no, and the DMV and the physician people say no, it should be this way. This sort of tells you, as the DMV people, what to expect if, if you decide to make these uh, these ch uh, recommended changes. Um, so that you know, gives you a whole picture of, you know, you could just say, yes, I can do this, I can change the world, but it's really not easy to do. And this will give you those steps. And of course, you know, just having this out on somebody's shelf is not going to save one life. Uh, what we have to do and what we're going to do in the, in the coming years is promote the use, encourage states like Iowa and all the others as well to go ahead and adopt this. To, to yes, say, okay, there is evidence for making this kind of policy change and let's go ahead and do it. So similar efforts uh, have gone through, um, you know, we've gone through similar efforts, excuse me, to, to develop uh, activities on transitioning from driving. That was something that was talked about earlier um, you know, we call it transitioning. Some people call it driving retirement. Um, what I really like to think of it is, you know, just moving over into the passenger seat because most of your trips uh, for older people are going to be in cars. They're not going to be jumping on the paratransit because in places around here there's not necessarily going to be the paratransit. Um, they're going to get a ride from the neighbor. They're going to get a ride from the adult, uh, adult child, most likely the daughter. Um, as I said earlier, when we started out this business, we really were saying, well, how are we going to get them off the road? And no, it's not going to work. Through our research, through our, our um, activities and partnerships, we came to realize that no, we have to do this this way. Most people are going to be fine and safe for most of their lives, really. It's just when you get to the end, when, when the functional abilities change, when functional abilities deteriorate, that you have to make those transitions, make those decisions to, to stop driving. And so we worked with the American Society on Aging to develop the driving transitions education. It's really for uh, geriatric social workers or anybody who works with older people or their families one-on-one -on, -one, um, on, on making, how do, you, how do you go through the process? Or do you, just say, okay, your driving career is over, sorry, give me the keys. No, it, it's not going to work that way. It's, it tells you how to go through, okay, you know, let, let's look at the driving. Let's, where do they go? What do they need to do? Where do they uh, feel their, their most value in driving? And how do you make sure that they maintain that value? So um, it's a very, I love this. This, uh, this education tool. Um, I have a couple copies here as well, so if you do have questions about it afterwards, please, please do let me know. Um, and again, it's, it's that whole research background that helped us get the credibility to make these basic, simple recommendations. Now, now that we've gotten these tools out, um, our aim is really to, to go into some of the harder issues. Um, 
where our future has us going is going to be more into this transitions world and more into the dementia world um, because one, there's really probably inadequate research in those areas, but there's also, those are the areas that are the thorniest, the things that the families and judiciary and licensing have the most challenges facing. They don't understand how to do it, to, so it's easy. It, I don't think it's ever gonna be easy, uh, particularly with dementia because there are good days and bad days, and there are days where, where people just, uh, you know, they suddenly drop off the cliff for, for cognitive function. And, and since driver licensing only sees people, what, every year, if they're on a, a short cycle, you know, that's 364 other days that this person could be out there driving. And, and that can't rest on the shoulders of, of licensing. It needs to rest on the shoulders of, of families, it needs to go on to physicians and other uh, social services people, as well as on law enforcement as our, our last resort. Uh, they need to understand how to act and how to, how to uh, change the behavior of that individual is putting others at risk. Now, in terms of, of going forward with today's work, um, I want you to think about um, where are the gaps? because these are the ways that we go about things at, at, at NHTSA on the national level too. Where are the gaps? What are we missing? What can we do? What's being done elsewhere that we can sort of tweak and make our own? Um, those are all good. And then like I said, our predictions are, are gonna either come true or uh, we're going to uh, have to tr change things around when, when uh, the baby boomers do start turning 65 next year. But uh, so, you know, just what we have to do. Is, is first is to look to the evidence. Um, and that's, you know, based on the this, this stuff that's in the back chapters of, of, uh, of this guide that we have, the medical guidelines, there's a lot in there. It says, okay, what other things can we research? Where, where, the, where is the evidence kind of dicey, kind of dodgy? See what you can do to, to make that better. Look where others aren't necessarily looking. What other rocks can you pull up? Um, in terms of older drivers, I mean, vision, I mean, we all know it's important, but there's not really any evidence that says what vision is, you know, what level of vision is, is unsafe and what is safe. It, it, is, it astounds me to realize that. Uh, Parkinson's disease is another issue that we need to look at a little more closely. The next thing I, I really want you to do, in particular today, is make connections. I think everybody has said this, you know, all the speakers this morning. Talk to other people. We're stronger and we make better decisions when we have other voices involved. And, and you know, for example, with, this, uh, with the, the, the driver fitness, we would never have been able to come up with as good a quality report if we hadn't had some of those um, really challenging people from Canada <laughs> we'll talk about. Um, they were, oh gosh, I love them to death, but oh, they were, they were fun. Um, and lastly, <laughs> um, I, I, as, as a make something useful person, um, I, want you, I want you to encourage theft. And the law enforcement people can go like that. Um, just don't, don't go reinventing the wheel. Don't do something that's exactly like what they're doing over in uh, Missouri or, or you know, Canada or something. You know, at the same time that they're doing it, look at what they're doing, get the results, and say, okay, now it's mine. I'm gonna make this an Iowa thing, or wherever it is that you're actually from. Take it back, but, you know, thieving is good. And, and the academics will say, oh, no, no, we can't do, no, this is, this is, uh, this is actually implementation, so you get to steal. Um, and besides, it's easier. So, uh, with that, I do wanna thank you, and uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to a productive meeting. Thank you.